Welcome to your Barbados to the Evening News Update for Friday, September 18. Government's decision to halt debt reduction efforts over the next two years is not an indication that it was strained from the Barbados Economic Recovery and Transformation Program. Minister in the Ministry of Finance, Ryan Strawn, made that position clear at the opening of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Barbados Public Sector Conference today. He also defended government's decision to provide $300 million in financing for the tourism and hospitality sector under the new Barbados Employment and Sustainable Transformation Program. We, we have a choice. We, the choice is simply, we either spend money to extend unemployment benefits, we either spend money to ultimately support the severance claims, um, that may come in for the tourism or all the other related entities. In which case, the liabilities, as I'm, as I'm speaking to accountants, obviously, um, once there's severance, it means that there's a liability on, on the business and therefore triggers a uh, whole raft of bankruptcy and insolvency matters that makes it almost impossible for any financial institution to look at any of the entities and indicate that they may be viable going forward. And therefore, the Barbados Employment and Sustainable um, sustainable, sustainable Transformation Program was designed specifically to respond in a very strategic way to ensuring that we re-engineer the way that the government now engages with the private sector in order to ensure that over the course of the next two years that we can keep as many businesses because we appreciate that once we can get and maintain a level of tourism activity across the economy, then that too will trigger the multiplier effect with respect to the rest of the, pri of the private sector. Education Minister Santia Bradshaw and other ministry officials toured a number of schools today to assess their readiness for Monday's reopening. The minister said that she was aware that there was a sense of anxiety among parents, teachers and other stakeholders. The attitude of teachers, even in the face of things not all being completed, has really been something that has warmed my heart because they are prepared to go back in and they are prepared to work with the ministry to find solutions to the problems. Parents have also stepped forward and I'm grateful to those two who have come forward to be able to carry some of the weight um, for the government um, because in a lot of cases, you know, we, we don't see parents um, playing the role sometimes that we are accustomed to. But I think the, the call has been made to strengthen the parent teachers associations. And we've seen, as we talked to various principals, that many of them have actually been coming forward and trying to work with the schools to be able to get them ready for um, this coming semester. Meantime, Acting Chief Education Officer Joy Adamson says all secondary schools should be ready for the start of the new school term on Monday. The secondary schools have all indicated that they're ready to start. There's some tweaking that they have to do. So one of the things that we would want to encourage parents and guardians to be patient at least in this first week or so. We know that there'll be things that they will have to amend, the things they will have to adjust. They might have to change their program at some point in time. Um, as they go into the situation. So we don't, and we have actually told them that first week is not any strict teaching. For that first week, we're actually getting your custom, making sure you know your protocols, making sure you know what you have to do, and um, going through the whole lunchtime, how persons will um, organize themselves and play. We have distributed the protocols today, so everybody should have access, and they will be on the GIS website and they'll be out there. Similar protocols to what we would have used early in the year. Just some additional additions. We have a section of a nursery and primary, for a nursery, because we would not have a, had a nursery section before. We would have met with the nursery principals and they're aware of what they have to do working in that environment. We also have specific protocols for the special needs as well. And the, those special needs children obviously have different arrangements. So those protocols have been added to the original. She also revealed that three primary schools will not be ready in time for Monday's reopening, namely St. Luke's Brighton, St. Martin's Mangrove and St. Giles Primary. She said alternative arrangements have been made to accommodate students. So what the principles for those schools 
have decided with their staff that they will have in the first instance online teaching. But we are also looking to place the class fours five days face to face so they've also identified alternate sites. I would have done a poll with the principals and the majority of the principals would have informed their parents on the expectations. They would have informed they've been meeting by year groups, they've been meeting by year levels to inform of how the school should look and what is supposed to happen. As we speak, I am aware that St. Giles Primary, they have been issued with the additional tablets that they need because all the schools would have updated the database as it relates to the students requiring tablets. And we're making sure that those three schools that would have to start online, that all of their pupils that they needed a device, that they have the devices. So they're in the process now of distributing those. Meanwhile, our president of the Barbados Union of Teachers, Pedro Shepard, has expressed concerns about what he described as last-minute transfers of school principals, particularly at the secondary school level. We are not sure what is happening there really because we were told that some persons were offered transfer letters and then they were rescinded and so on. So we have some level of uncertainty at the secondary level in terms of the leadership at those schools. I am told that there are some persons who have been transferred from their schools, effectively the 21st. Now what concerns me as a union leader in the education fraternity is that you, you, while, while you have the, the, the power to transfer, I think the timing of the transfers really is the concern. And all during the summer break, we would have been asking our principals and management teams at schools and so on to have schools ready for the reopening of schools. And persons would have been working towards the reopening of their schools, putting the plans in place. And at the last minute then, you are issuing transfer letters to those same persons who would have been preparing for their um, substantive schools. The Barbados Port Inc. is on its way to becoming the most recognized port in the Eastern Caribbean. That is according to Prime Minister Mia Motley and Minister of Maritime Affairs and the Blue Economy, Kirk Humphrey, who together officially opened the port's new administrative building, Cube Blue, this morning. The state-of-the-art $20 million three-story building, which was built by Caribbean Consultants Limited, will also be used to house the Ministry of Maritime Affairs and the Blue Economy. One of the things that we said is that the port has to become more efficient and that it does not make us feel good that of 190 countries or so, Barbados was ranked 129 in the Doing Business Index. And that when it comes to trade across borders, which is what really is a more reflection of the port, Barbados was 132. So we were worse off when it comes to how we were ranked in terms of what we do in the port. And we felt that was not good enough. And there have been a number of improvements, and I just wish to tell you all about some. As mid-September 2020, dwell time was reduced from eight or nine days to three days at the port of Bridgetown. The truck turnaround time, which previously hovered at about 45 minutes, but claimed in the range of 60 to 70 minutes as a result of challenges encountered with Asakura, is now down to 30 minutes. And for the first time in history of the port, there is an established protocol of joint cargo inspections by the Ministry of Commerce, Port Health, Plant Quarantine, Customs Agencies, which further enhance the delivery of times and cargo to customers. In her brief comments, Prime Minister Motley said it was her vision for the port to be the most recognized in the region. I want to signal that it is this government's intention to literally work with all, from the workers to the management, to the board, to the stakeholders, to the security persons, to ensure that the Bridgetown port becomes literally the port that is most recognized in the Eastern and Southern Caribbean. And for that to happen, it is going to mean that we have a lot of catching up to do. I want simply to signal the will of this government to make these things happen, to ensure that uh, to ensure that in doing so, 
that we have the ability to be able to never lose sight of why we are doing what we are doing. And that first and foremost, it is about making a better life for our people. There's regional and international news after this short break. from our regional neighbors, the Ministry of Health in Jamaica says it is struggling to clear a backlog of COVID-19 tests. The announcement comes as the country continues its fight against the virus. The details of that story from Television Jamaica. Speaking at a press briefing on Thursday, Chief Medical Officer Dr. Jacqueline Bisesa mckenzie said it's a daily challenge to bring the COVID-19 testing up to date. It comes after more concerns from persons waiting for test results. Dr. Bisesa McKenzie explained that the backlog is still mainly due to a shortage of testing. We have discussed the challenges that we face in terms of um, availability of the um, reagents on a consistent basis. So I know that many persons are concerned. They see the testing at 300, 400, um, some days, 500, some days, and then they see a spike, 700, 800, 900 tests. Whenever we see those spikes, that's what, that means that we have gotten a supply of test kits. She further stated that the ministry is using two different methods of testing. Testing on the open PCR machine where we are supplied with reagents through PAHO WHO and through some procurements on our own. And that continues and on a regular basis ranges the test amount ranges from between 300 to 500 tests on those machines. When we have the COBUS machine um, working at the same time, we will get about the same amount of tests on the COBUS itself, so we will double the numbers of tests that test results that we see. And finally, the Director General of the World Health Organization urges countries to work together and invest to ensure that a pandemic with the magnitude and severity like COVID-19 never happens again. Dr. Tigros Gabrieso says, with the right political and financial commitment and investment implemented now, countries can prevent and mitigate future pandemics. In a world that's heating up and where intensified human activity is shrinking wild spaces, the likelihood of a spillover of a novel pathogen from animals to humans is increasing. We know for certain that there will be future novel viruses and another so-called disease X. But we also have the tools and know-how that the only way come from this global threats is as a global community united in solidarity and committed to long-term cooperation that's news but for the very latest visit us at www.barbidestoday.bb you can also subscribe to our e-paper email updates or like us on facebook and sign up for our breaking news alerts via whatsapp we're also on Izumi Media in bus terminals, as well as screenplay at supermarkets and gas stations near you. And you can also hear us on Mix 96.9 FM and Capital Media HD 99.3 FM.